So good morning, everyone. We uh, can finally start uh, the physics in uh, these uh, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker metrics, which I'm going to call Friedman metrics, just because it's just too complicated to say. Uh, so this is a metric we derived on the basis of some symmetry principles. Uh, so minus dt square, it's a diagonal metric. There's a preferred time. This is cosmological time. And the whole information about the dynamics of the universe is hidden in this uh, conformal factor R of t. Uh, HK is a spatial, spatial metric. So it's a metric on the level sets of t. And uh, which is maximally symmetric, takes this relatively simple form. K is a number which is zero plus minus one. Plus one corresponds to positive curvature, minus one corresponds to negative curvature, zero, uh, the space part of the metric is flat. And uh, so the question is, what is R? And this is going to be given to us by Einstein equations. But before we uh, go into that, we're going to do the Hubble law, and with a little help of Eva. Um, um, I think the last one we had was just uh, 6.2. Okay, so and what was the title of 6.2? Cosmolo cosmological principles. Oh, okay, good. So this will be three. Hubble law. And uh, so, yeah, from now on, we look at this metric here. And we have a co moving observers. So uh, these have word lines give on the form t goes to uh, t and a constant. So the space part, right? So the space part is constant. Space part is constant. So one way of, of looking at this, so for example, if K was uh, equal one, then we'll have a family of uh, spheres which expand. So this is, uh, oh, I can actually even make an artistic impression of a sphere. Wow. Okay, so. At, at T1, we have one sphere and they're expanding, maybe they're contracting, who knows? But I mean, this, in this picture, they're expanding. And uh, uh, so a co moving point would be somebody sitting on the North Pole, just sitting on the North Pole all the time, sitting on the South Pole, would be sitting on the South Pole all the time, and so forth, right? Somebody on the equator keeps sitting on the same point on the equator. And so the co moving observers have these word lines. Uh, uh, given by this form, so uh, velocity vector d over dt. This is normalized, uh, of course, g of uh, uh, u, u is dtt, it's minus one. So this is a unit, uh, unit vector. And the question is, what is the distance between uh, co-moving observers So let me make sure that this is the distance with respect uh, to the physical metric. So, so this is, uh, well, in this case, the, this is going to be the space part of this metric. Uh, so this is the distance of, so the physical distance between uh, two moving observers. Uh, so at P1 uh, at, and P2, right? So, so this would be, a, you have a point P1 here, here, P2 here. So P1 has become this point, P2 has become this point. And of course, the distance with respect to the matrix H, HK hasn't changed because everything that happened in the, in the conformal factor, but because the whole thing has 
patent, then, um, then the distance has changed, right? So let's see. So, so let's try to look at this. So DGP1, P2, by definition, it's going to be the infimum over the uh, curves uh, from P1 to P2. Uh, integral of g of gamma dot gamma dot. So maybe uh, it would not be a good idea to parameterize this curves by t because we'll get confused with the time here. So so let's see. So lambda uh, gamma of lambda uh, is this curve, and gamma dot then will be. Right, so at constant t, at constant. So we're interested in a physical space distance, right? So, good. Good. So, uh, so we have this, uh, but square root of g, uh, this thing is just. If I take a square root, uh, I can take the R of T in front and I get square root of HK at gamma dot gamma dot. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, so G had an R square, but there is a square root, so that's why you get. in R and integral over HK of gamma dot gamma dot. And now this is the distance in HK. So this distance doesn't change, right? Because these things are a fixed coordinates on this underlying manifold. So this uh, thing doesn't change. Um, now, uh, maybe uh, one thing to notice is that uh, then this is, uh, uh, if we just look at this uh, star, then if I write in uh, the gamma dot here, I'm going to get square root of uh, r dot square over one minus k r square plus r square. And uh, let me write this symbolically omega dot square, right? So omega dot square here. Now, th this is the metric, the omega is a metric on a sphere, right? So let me not write it symbolically because we might get confused, but let me just write it explicitly. Why not? It doesn't cost me much. So, so this is theta dot square plus. I mean, it doesn't really matter because the important thing here is that this is positive. So this is larger equal than this integral. Which is just the integral dr of square root one minus k r square from r1 to r2, right? Well, which is louder equal, right? If I just take any curve, no, this is actually equal. So this is equal. So 
So R1 would be the radial position of P1 and R2 would be the radial coordinate of, of P2. Okay. So this distance is actually this uh, radial integral, right? So dhk P1 P2 is just, I, I don't think we'll need much of it, but just, uh, Good. But uh, let's see. So this is going to be our, maybe we put an equation one here. I'm going to put an equation two here. I'm going to put an equation three, even though we don't need it. And let me just erase this part. By the way, I call this section Hubble low because that's what people do, but the name is completely wrong. So, because, uh, well, I, I let you figure it out why this has really, there's a completely wrong way of looking at the Hubble low. Maybe I, I keep it in mind, right? Okay, maybe we'll discuss it, but keep it in mind why, why this is what we're doing is completely done even. So, so, so what I'm calculating here is not, I mean, wh whatever I wrote here is still correct, right? So it's not that whatever I, I wrote is wrong, but it's the interpretation of this equation that we're going to write down as a Hubble though is actually not the right one. Good, so now, so let's see. So now if we change, uh, uh, if we look at the velocity, which is the rate of change of the distance uh, of uh, between these points. Well, by equation two, then this is going to be the derivative of R times, uh, this doesn't change, uh, dH, okay, of uh, P1, P2. And nothing prevents me to uh, divide by R and multiply. And we recognize this as our distance, right? And this is the distance. Uh, so this is uh, uh, R prime over R times dt. So if we just call this uh, D for simplicity, then we have that V is equal R of T, well, this depends upon T, but R of T between and between the points, R dot of T over R of T times the distance. So we call this H of T is uh, this function here. And we call T zero is the time today. And what we're saying that V is H naught today is the, D, the velocity of an object, uh, which is moving with this uh, cosmological time is proportional to the physical distance on the level set of the function, right? So this is how below. So I'm afraid I don't remember the years, but this Hubble law was actually uh, derived exactly in this form by Lemaitre a few years before, uh, uh, derived and published, right? So derived and published exactly by saying the following, look guys, 
we have these cosmological models. Uh, F L R W here stands for L because he derived this model independently. And he said, in such a universe, we should see galaxies moving away from us with a velocity uh, which depends, uh, which is proportional to the distance. So he derived this equation and explained why it's coming from. Uh, well, as you're going to see, the explanation is maybe not the ideal one, but uh, uh, he derived this formula. And uh, this is what uh, um, Hubble observed without knowing where it's coming from, right? We just said, well, we have this property period. So, so of course, uh, uh, the, now the official te terminology uh, officially accepted by the Astronomical Union is to say that this is the hubble lemaitre law rather than the hubble law. But, um, but uh, in fact, it should be the lemaitre law. Good. So why, why is this wrong? Why does this have nothing to do with the, with the universe, this formula? Well, I let you think about it, but uh, before I try to explain to you why I think it's completely wrong and just the interpretation of this calculation is, well, the formula is correct, but has nothing to do with what we're observing. Uh, let me go to uh, the cosmological redshift. So that would be uh, six four, I think, uh, Eva. Yes, that should be it. Great, thanks. That is this world uh, short term memory, but I forgot what it means. So. So six four. These are really short, short sections compared to what we did <laughs> during the last few lectures. Good. Six four would be then uh, yes, uh, cosmological redshift. So the question is the following. Uh, uh, a co-moving well this one is actually yes well it is relevant a co-moving uh, observer emits at frequency omega o uh, omega e for emitter Right, so E is for emitter. Uh, what would be, uh, what is the frequency seen by a co-moving observer? So co-moving means that it has constant space coordinates. as frequency and then this one is going to be observed 
omega O, right? So omega is for O is for observer and E is for emitter. So we have already seen various uh, redshifts. Of course, the classical one would be uh, would be the uh, I'm smiling get you cut <laughs> he, he, he doesn't know it. <laughs> cool, great. <laughs> uh, so um, yes, so, so there are Doppler effects, of course, but uh, uh, we've seen another one in in the Schwarzschild field, right? So in the Schwarzschild field, we had a redshift due to gravitational field, and uh, this question: What is this uh, uh, frequency? Not frequent, frequency. Frequency. Okay. Um, Uh, the, the, the calculation we're going to do uh, to answer this question is essentially the same as what we did for Schwarzschild. So I could say, uh, obviously, everyone here remembers how we did it for Schwarzschild. So uh, here is the result. I will not be that mean. So, so, so let's see, right? So we have this uh, uh, time of uh, emission, and maybe there'll be two times of emission and there'll be two times of observation and so a photon is emitted from here to there and uh, the first the emitter is come moving and the observer is come moving and so one period later there will be another photon thing here, right? So we have a T emission two. Uh, we have a delta T emission, and we have a delta T observation. And the frequency uh, is uh, both frequencies are inversely proportional to one over delta t right so if this is exactly one period later then that's going to be uh, that's going to be what's observed here and uh, what else can i say here probably not much right so these are Null geodesics, of course, right? So these are null geodesics. Light propagates on null geodesics. And uh, because of the isometry, uh, which uh, of, of the space time, I can always uh, say move one of the, the emitter on the nose pole and the observer wherever he is. And then this null geodesic will be a radial geodesic. Okay, so so radial uh, without growth of generality. Right, we have a geodesic between two points. The group of isometries acts transitively both on points and at the directions. So we can just first move one of the guys to the center of the coordinates by an isometry, and then. Um, yeah, the geodesic must be radial. Uh, without loss of generality, without loss of generality. W log is without loss of generality. Good. Uh, so I could give you the formula uh, which we're going to get, but uh, let's make a suspense last and uh, just derive it.
I'm wondering how, how this works, that this has to be radial, because there is a simpler argument for this. Of course, we could just calculate this and make sure that, that this works, but uh, probably the argument would be, well, that certainly by homogeneity, I can move one point at the center of, the, of this coordinate system. And uh, then if the geodesics was not radial, uh, re re rem remember that the isotropy group uh, acts transitively on the tangent space, right? So we have a direction of this geodesic going from one to the other. Uh, and uh, if, uh, uh, if the direction was, uh, if the geodesic was not radial, I can just, uh, by acting by an isot element of the isotropy group, I get a, a different curve, which is geodesic from this point to this one. Now, forget it. Now, it just doesn't help. Now. I didn't say anything, right? So just uh, rewind uh, one minute of the lecture backward. Yeah. Good. So anyway, uh, we have this radial geodesic. So now, uh, and so it's null. So we have zero is uh, uh, minus dt or square plus uh, dr square over one minus kr square along this geodesic, right? Along the geodesic uh, and I shouldn't forget the R of course, which is the same as saying that uh, DT over R of T is plus minus uh, integral DR over square root one minus KR square. And um, well, so choose plus for future directed, plus for future directed. And uh, this is just the distance uh, in the metric HK uh, between these points, right? So uh, between then the uh, emitter and observer, right? So this is P emitter and P observer. Good, so set tau is this integral here. And now if we look at this uh, first geodesic, then from this equation, we're going to get that tau of observation. Well, let's, let's look at the second. Two is minus tau of observation one is the distance between these two points, p a meter, p observer. And if we look at the pre first one, we get uh, observation two and Emission two, of course. And uh, so this is along this, uh, this geodesic and on the lower one, we get T observation one minus T emission one is again, the same distance. So if I just take the difference between these two equations, we get that delta T observation is equal delta, well, not T, but delta tau, delta tau of emission. All right, so this is an exact formula for uh, for what happens along these geodesics. And now, um, well, well, let me just uh, get some room. And if you remember the picture for the gravitation sh shift in, uh, in Schwarzschild, this was exactly the same picture. But essentially the same argument, 
there's a difference with this factor r of t in the Schwarzschild case we wouldn't have had this factor r of t so rather than having delta tau here we would get directly delta t so up to this uh, factor r which floats around it's the same calculation Good. So now uh, I've erased my picture, but uh, so if uh, uh, this emission time, of course, if delta tau emission is very small, uh, uh, then uh, this integral, uh, which will be the integral between tau emission one to tau emission two dt over r of t is essentially the same as one over uh, well actually t not tau right t is essentially the difference of times so delta t emission divided by r of t emission in other words r of t is constant during the uh, emission time. Think about the scales here, right? We have light arriving to us from a nearby star, a galaxy. So the times involved are uh, comparable to the wavelengths uh, or when C is one or actually one to the inverse frequency. And compared to the scales uh, where this scale factor of the universe it changes this is just ridiculous right so this from a physical point of view this is not approximate this is exact and then we have similarly uh, tau observation is delta uh, t observation over r of t observation and so finally we get uh, this was probably equation four so we get equation five that delta T emission over R of T emission is the same as delta tau observation over R of tau observation. Now, T is a proper time of the moving observers. Right, so, so the four velocities vector is u over d over dt, so which means that uh, the uh, yeah, well, uh, the proper time is 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 just t, right? So, So, so now this is really the proper time. Therefore, the frequency uh, is just inversely proportional to proper time. So we're going to get omega uh, te times r of te is equal omega t observation r of 
time observation. And in terms of wavelengths, then uh, because the wavelength is inversely proportional to omega, then we get the same formula as, as here. So this is uh, this is our equation, maybe six. The wavelengths is what astronomers like because when they take a spectrum, they get the wavelengths. So uh, this is something that they can observe, and uh, if they have a star or a galaxy emitting uh, light somewhere there. Uh, they look at the spectrum, they take a guess that this uh, uh, line is coming from, should have this, uh, emission, uh, this emission frequency because it's coming from some known uh, process. And we are observing this uh, line, which is shifted when we look at the spectrum. And so this gives us information about the ratio of the scale factors of the universe, right? So we're not getting information about the scale factor itself, but out of this, we get information about the um, um, ratio of the scale factors. So uh, there is this famous uh, Z uh, factor. So Z is defined as lambda observed minus lambda emitted over lambda emitted. And this is the redshift Z factor. And this is what uh, astronomers use all the time when talking about galaxies, right? So this is uh, sitting at factor Z equal whatever it is. And this is actually what really is in the Hubble law, right? So the Hubble law relates the Z factor with the velocities. And that's what we're going to do right now. So our next aim uh, is to derive the relationship between V, H naught, and Z. Uh, so let's try to, to do this. Uh, this should be E, by the way. So one takes here the immediate frequency, right? So this is the, because this is the shift of the line, right? The spectral line has a hypothetical free, uh, length lambda e, and then this is shifted like that. Okay, this should be e not, not o. Yeah, so how does this work? Uh, well, uh, z is, uh, uh, well, lambda zero, over lambda e minus one, right? Because this one, this gives you a one. And lambda zero over lambda e we have from here. Lambda zero 
uh, over lambda e is r zero over r e minus one. In other words, r zero minus r e divided by r e. So what is r zero minus r e? So uh, let me be more explicit. R zero is R of T zero minus R of the T emission divided by R of T emission. You don't have to copy this, but that's just I rewrote this. Uh, and this one we do by a Taylor expansion. So we're saying that uh, R of T emission is R prime of T emission times, well, this difference is T zero minus T emission over R T emission. So this is approximate, right? So a Taylor expansion here at uh, TE, right? Taylor at TE. But this is nothing else that our Hubble function, that's H of uh, TE times T zero minus E. And uh, what else can I say? Uh, and so, so uh, I could stop here, but now if uh, the Hubble constant doesn't change much uh, during the time, right? So H is, uh, uh, so in other words, H of T E is about the same as H of T observation, then this is H zero times T zero minus T. So this is going to be our equation seven. So Z is equal H zero T O minus T. Probably won't need this anymore. Um, and we still want to uh, relate this to, uh, to, to V. So what we're trying to do now is to relate this to experiments, right? Because in the experiment, you get spectra. So, so you know what Z is. And uh, this is the equation that one is interested in. Just tie this Z to other things of interest. So, so we have an equation Z is proportional to this cosmological difference of this cosmological times, but we don't know what the cosmological times are, right? So, so it's not very helpful at this stage, but let's come back to the uh, definition of, yes, so uh, tau observation minus tau emission is this integral of dt uh, over, well, uh, between T emission to time observation and uh, over R of T. And um, this was equal to the distance, right? So this was equal to the distance is this uh, metric uh, HK. So not the physical distance, but with this metric HK uh, between the uh, emitter and observer. And now this thing is 
if r doesn't change much right if r of t is constant then this will be uh, t e minus t o minus t e divided by r of t o so T observation minus T emission is about the same as R of T zero times D H K of P zero P H. And this is nothing but the distance with respect to the metric G. So equation eight. And finally, if we put eight into seven, We get that Z is equal H zero D. So this is the right form of the Hubble low all a match. In terms of Z. And the redshift factor Z is directly proportional to the distance. And so here the assumption was if R, uh, well, at, at, at distances at scale, So that both H and R do not change much. Right. So, of course, there'll be corrections if these things change, but. Uh, to leading order. This is the formula. In fact, of course, there are connections. If H0 is not constant, then we need to take this into account. And the thing which measures this is called the deceleration parameter, right? So to get a better approximation, one needs to um, take into account that R changes, R dot changes. So People have, of course, uh, done that. So uh, next, uh, better approximation. I'm not going to do the better approximation, but I just uh, going to tell you how people do this uh, to take into account. In particular, that uh, H dot is not zero. So in other words, we could just take this calculation and make an, exp this is essentially what I did is a Taylor expansion to first order in all the formulae. And I've neglected all quadratic terms, but one can repeat this calculation, making a Taylor expansion to say second order, right? And then we're going to get correction formula for these equations. And so one introduces uh, something called the uh, deceleration parameter. It's called Q.
And this is something which measures the second derivatives of the scale factor. And now, rather than calling this an acceleration parameter, uh, people call this deceleration parameter because for a long time they thought, well, that the, either the cosmological constant is zero or negative. In other words, the universe is either uh, if the well, if this uh, if if uh, if the Hubble constant doesn't change, if the Hubble function, uh, so remember, h of t was r dot over r, and h naught was just h today. So people thought that maybe this Hubble constant is actually a constant, and then r second would be zero. It's the same to say that r second is zero. Or maybe it is uh, decreasing. And therefore, they put a minus here because they thought that this parameter would be positive. And it's always nice to have uh, positive functions rather than having to worry about signs. So when you define this deceleration parameter, you think, well, I want something which measure the rate of change of h, which means a measure second derivatives of the scale factor. And I want something which is scale invariant because there's no way I can know what r is. I mean, this is a, just a, well, maybe you could actually by some very, if we could measure the curvature of this metric, we would know what r is, but that's way of, uh, what we can do today. So let's define a parameter which is scale invariant. So let's see. So there are two time derivatives. Uh, so to get uh, rid of, to make it invariant for uh, with respect to time, you divide by r dot square, right? That's the, that's going to get rid of the fact that we don't know what this time, cosmic time is. Uh, then the derivative for respect to this time, at least the scale will go away. But now I have two R's here. I have only one here. Then uh, that's the obvious way to make it scale invariant, right? So if you want to think about the deceleration parameter, so there's a minus because it's a deceleration rather than acceleration. And uh, R to the time derivative, so divide by r dot square and one r missing, so I put it here. Good, but the bottom line is that the experiments tell you, well, h naught, now h naught is funny because there are two experiments uh, which are giving you the numbers here. One number is 73 plus minus two from supernova. And one number is uh, 67 plus minus one from CMB. So, of course, uh, plus minus, what does plus minus mean, right? So these are statistical uncertainties. Uh, so plus minus two at the level of one sigma. So in other words, at level of one sigma, these numbers are different, right? So if you really believe that we have an accuracy to the level of one sigma in uh, astronomy, then we have a problem, right? We do say, well, actually, these numbers would overlap at what? Uh, two sigma, right? So they're, they're equal up to two sigma. So if you're happy with a two sigma overlap, then these numbers are the same. If you think that these numbers are really significant, then there is a, a problem in cosmology that these observations are not quite the same. That's called the Hubble constant tension. Right? So Hubble constant tension.
and uh, now q q is equal to minus no, zero zero six plus minus zero 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 one this is coming from the supernova and this number is worth a Nobel Prize. It's a Nobel Prize. 2011. Uh, Perlmutter, Schmidt, and Ries. Uh, right, so observation of supernova shows that the Hubble constant is actually changing in time. It is. Neg Q is negative, therefore R second is positive, therefore we have accelerated expansion, expansion of the universe. H is the expansion rate of the universe is increasing. We are in a universe which, to the best of our knowledge, is in a phase of expanding, in an expanding phase. So, um, we have Q, uh, we have H, and the question is, uh, what are physical models which are compatible with this kind of uh, behavior? So, uh, just a naive observation, uh, suppose that uh, H actually is constant, right? So h of t is h0 is constant. We know it's wrong, right? We know it's wrong because uh, if this parameter is in zero, then it means that h has to change. Then uh, this means what? Well, h was r dot over r is equal to h. Uh, let's see. That's not all what I wanted. No. <laughs> uh, suppose that uh, that this this becomes complicated. I don't want to make something complicated now. Let's see. So uh, suppose that our dot is constant, right? So that would yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is really a bad example of lecturing. So second today, when I have to take back what, what I said. Uh, suppose that R of T is just um, a constant, right? So R of T is a constant, uh, linear. That R of T is linear uh, is uh, a constant time T. Yeah, that, that was what I wanted. 
then h0 is equal r dot uh, of t0 divided by r of t0, which is going to be r dot of z0 is c divided by c t0 is one over t0. Oh, yeah. So that's what I wanted. So in other words, uh, if you look at the scale fa factor t and r of t, then if we're looking at, we are living at time t0, then the scale factor was 0 at uh, times 1 over h0. So, of course, here we have something dramatic, which is called the Big Bang. So, in a finite time to our past, this scale factor vanished. So, all physics just went to hell, right? So, the space part of the metric disappeared. If you want to think about this in terms of this expanding object, then the, the whole, every matter in the universe can contracted to one point if we go backward. In other words, everything exploded. Uh, Lemaitre was a Catholic priest, and he thought that this was actually evidence for the act of creation of God. Right? So for him, this Big Bang is the act of creation of the universe. And that's the way he was thinking about it. And some people still might do this. In, in any case, uh, uh, if you put uh, the numbers here, you use the value here, which is uh, say, and I didn't tell you what the, <laughs> what the units are, which is quite a ridiculous. Uh, so you can see that I'm not a physicist, right? I'm just a mathematician. Numbers are okay, units don't matter. So I would fail uh, Einführung in Physik 1. Uh, yeah, just uh, zero. Uh, big, big five in Austria. Good, anyway, so, so the units, right? What are the units here? It's uh, uh, about 70 uh, kilometers by second by megaparsec. And uh, what's a megaparsec? Maybe somebody with uh, a touch of astrophysics knowledge can help us. What's a megaparsec? No one? Well, that's some number. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 writing 70 would have been as good enough, right? But I mean, if you put this number in here, then you're going to get that T naught, which is uh, then with this approximation, one over H naught is about 14 giga years. And uh, this is uh, about the right time for stars to form. Which means that if you get much less than this, you'll be in trouble with our theory of star formation, right? So, so if you get a number smaller than this one from some other calculations, then the stars as we understand them and as we understand the evolutions would not have had enough time to form in the universe. Right? So um, either the model is wrong or our understanding of star evolution would be wrong in a universe like that. So this is a number to keep in mind. Uh, in fact, uh, the number one gets from something called Lambda CMB model, 
which I'm going to explain in details. Uh, uh, so we feed the uh, plus observations, gives you uh, the lifetime of the universe that there was a big bang in the universe and the, uh, it took place about 13.7 giga years ago. So, which is compatible with this one, right? So uh, it's slightly smaller than 14, but it's, it's actually still uh, in the right order. So this is how old our universe is in this Lambda CMD model. Lambda is the cosmological constant. And CMD means called uh, CDM, CMD. Is it CDM? I thought it was CMD, right? So this is called dark matter, called dark matter. CMD should be CDM, right? CMD sounds better. <laughs> it's probably C CDM. Okay. Uh, so, so I'm going to explain you how this works uh, mathematically. Uh, we've seen uh, well the next lecture, and the, we still have a few minutes to go today. So, good. So, so now uh, the question arises: Well, can what can we say about this function of OT? What do Einstein equation tell us? about this function. In fact, we can calculate what R of t should be uh, using Einstein equations. We have a metric. Uh, we write down Einstein equations. We solve them and we know what R of t is. Uh, well, Einstein equations need some help. Namely, you have to tell them what uh, the matter content of universes. And that is going to be the one of the questions concerning modeling. So this is a uh, next section. Uh, is it six five uh, Eva or six six? It uh, should be six five. Great. So uh, yes, uh, F R R W metrics and Einstein equations. So uh, what are Einstein equations? R mu nu minus R half G mu nu plus lambda G mu nu uh, is equal kappa T mu nu. And kappa is whatever it is, right? So it's probably some kind of uh, eight pi G over C uh, to some power. Um, so that's the equation and well this constant we don't know what it is but it's going to be uh, the observations uh, and the Einstein equations for this metric are going to tell us what it is and uh, uh, kappa we know what it is but the main question is what is this what is the meaning Um, so uh, the following facts are true. So fact, well, you can just take this metric, calculate its re re curvature tensor, Ricci tensor, and this Einstein tensor, and uh, one is compatible with um, a T mu nu of the form rho plus p 
u mu u nu plus d g mu nu. So in other words, even if you don't know anything about matter of the universe, if you take this kind of metric, you're going to get the left-hand side will be compatible with this, okay? Well, it takes this form, actually. So it's, it's more than compatible. It takes the form, right? Good. So uh, P equals zero, we already know. Right, so this is T mu nu is equal rho u mu u nu, then this is dust. So one could say, well, let's uh, think of galaxies or maybe clusters of galaxies uh, being uh, described by, by dust, right? So self-gravitating gas, so they dust, they just interact gravitationally and uh, so rho would be the density uh, of these things. Of course, u mu is uh, uh, the vector field we had here. So u mu is uh, dt. And of course, rho and p have to be uh, only functions of time. So that's the simplest model you can think of. You're going to take P equals zero, uh, rho is whatever it is. So require that this metric satisfies Einstein equations with this energy momentum tensor, see what happens. And we're going to do this uh, shortly, but before we do, Uh, before we do, let's just uh, discuss the more general case uh, with p on zero. So the question is, why should one want to take uh, P non-zero to start with? Uh, now, if P is non-zero, this is called as a perfect fluid energy momentum tensor. If you think about how it looks like, uh, so in an iron frame, um, so in a uh, maybe uh, let me just not talk about iron frames, but just for a um, local inertial frame, which is good enough. So in a local inertial frame, local inertial frame, uh, in which U is D over DT, uh, of course, we have this immediately, but the space part is not uh, uh, not necessarily of this form. Then uh, T would be, uh, let's see, it's going to have uh, rho plus P and a lot of zeros for, uh, maybe I should write it differently.
Good. So in the local inertial frame, the metric is diagonal, right? So G mu nu would be, uh, uh, so this is, okay, let me start with the, with G mu nu, and then plus rho plus P, uh, this tensor U mu U nu. Now U has only, uh, so, so U naught is uh, one, uh, uh, well, U, U mu up is one, a lot of zeros, and U down is also, uh, well, actually minus one, right? Minus one, a lot of zeros. So if I take this tensor product, I'm going to get two minus ones, which become a one and a lot of zeros. And this is, of course, <laughs> yeah, well, today's not a good day. But I get there. I still have a, a few years before my retirement to improve my lecturing. So. Yeah, and I'm spending a lot of time to write a triviality, which probably most of you already uh, understood, uh, right? So P times the metric, so it's a one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. So you get rho plus P minus P, so it's rho, zero, 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 zero and P, zero, zero, P. Yeah. I should have written this immediately and just not <laughs> spend five uh, backboards to do this, right? So, so in other words, the if you are in a local inertial coordinates, uh, so that should be C, not F, but never mind, uh, where this this matter is not moving, then it has a density rho, and it has a pressure which is the same in all directions, right? So this is a Typical case of a fluid, which has this property, fluids have an isotropic pressure on all directions and some density. That's why it's called a perfect fluid. And, uh, and so, so that would be, that is something which is certainly compatible with the Friedman form of the metric. And then to get a, a, a closed system of equation, you need an equation of state. Uh, which is say uh, P equal P of rho or P of rho or, or rho is equal to rho of P. So this is, this is called an equation of state. Uh, to get a, a, a well-posed uh, system of equations. And now you wonder, well, it doesn't perhaps make any sense to model galaxies by some kind of fluid with an equation of state. What, this, what should this equation of state would be? So uh, obviously the simplest solution taking no pressure is a good one if you just ignore the fact that there is other matter in the universe. And an important contribution is actually CMB, right? The cosmic microwave wave background is filling the universe. Uh, so uh, this is something which you need to take into account. And uh, there is a, a way of modeling electromagnetic radiation uh, with such an energy momentum tensor, which is based on the fact uh, that the energy momentum tensor of uh, Maxwell fields has zero trace. So, uh, so this is the second ingredient in our cosmology the current cosmological model would have uh, a density of galaxies 
and a contribution of an energy momentum tensor. Of course, uh, if we have a, an energy momentum tensor of, of this form, we could have several such things, right? So if we have several sources, forms of matter, each uh, having an energy momentum of this form, then their uh, sum will still be of this form, right? So we could just add matter, uh, a contribution from dust, which would be galaxies, and we can add a contribution of Maxwell fields, assuming it can take this form. And in fact, we also need a uh, add a contribution from neutrinos, which are play uh, an important, a non-zero part in the dynamics of the universe. Neutrinos will also have this form. And uh, the thinking here is that uh, you're going to get an energy momentum tensor describing these fields, uh, which has uh, a specific equation of state. Which is called no, uh, well, which is called a radiation equation of state, which is p is equal to one third of rho. Uh, so that's the uh, model. So radiation uh, T mu nu of this form. So uh, so T mu nu say of this form. Uh, uh, I need to say that this equation eight. Maybe there was equation six or seven. I don't know, but uh, let's call it eight. Right? Radiation is eight with uh, trace of the energy momentum equals zero. And the justification for this is that uh, uh, Maxwell fields satisfy this, right? Maxwell fields satisfy this. And so if you remember that uh, T mu nu for Maxwell fields would be a constant, which I certainly don't remember. So I just ignore this. Uh, F mu alpha minus one quarter F alpha beta F alpha beta T mu nu. This is probably one over four, four pi or something like that. Right. And this has the property T mu nu is zero, uh, just by, it's obviously zero, right? If you take the trace of this, uh, you're going to get this term and the trace of the metric is four. So it's zero. And I don't, now a better justification than this one. Uh, so you know that there should be a radiation fields and radiation fields have a energy momentum tensor which has zero trace. This energy momentum tensor has the right form uh, for this metric. So if this contains radiate Maxwell fields, uh, then it should have zero trace. And if we calculate the trace of this thing, then this is going to be, uh, one has to be a little careful with the signs here, right? But uh, trace is zero, but remember that this is a trace with respect to the Minkowski metric. So if you take the trace, you have to raise the indices on this entry. And uh, so you're going to pick a minus here. So minus rho plus 3p equals zero, which is the same as p is equal one third of rho.
So, so the model is going to be, we have galaxies which are perfect dust. We have a component which is Maxwell fields, which is uh, of this form with P equal one third row. And uh, we have a cosmological constant. Uh, this is the lambda uh, called dark matter model. Um, called because we're modeling galaxies by dust. Uh, there could be models where you add a model of galaxies, at least at early times, which have some intrinsic temperature, and then it's going to be a, the energy momentum tensor is going to be different. Uh, well, or, or the, the equation of state or whatever. So, Now, once we've decided what the matter fields are going to be, well, we need to write down Einstein equations. And uh, for this, well, you know what to do. Take the metric, calculate the curvature tensor, Ricci tensor, put everything into the Einstein equations. You're going to get a system of equations and obviously, we're not going to do this calculation because first it's boring and second we don't have time to do this uh, in this uh, one lecture and a few minutes left in this semester or in this course So the second fact is what Einstein equations look like, and I'm just going to give you the result. And uh, if you happen to get this question during the exam, I will give you these equations here. So I don't have to remember them. I for once, well, hopefully you remember them today. I'm not even sure, but certainly I would have to check in a while uh, what, how they look like so so Einstein equations are equivalent to the following two equations first there's the Friedman equation and I think let's see I let me try to uh, hope for the best So there should be something like kappa rho plus lambda, and there should be something coming from, uh, I think that's it. I'll check. Okay, and, uh, and there's another equation, uh, which is d over dt uh, rho r cube. plus d r cube over dt is equal to zero. Yeah, I just ran out of felt marker and the time is out. So let me nevertheless just finish writing these equations. That's going to be our starting point next for the next lecture. Uh, three r square yes okay i have it right good and there's of course a p missing here good yeah so these are <coughs> the einstein equations are equivalent to this in fact they're equivalent in the region where r r dot is non-zero right so 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 r equals zero would be not interesting r dot equals zero you could Still get something else, maybe, but uh, in this uh, in this set. So this is uh, our starting point. In the next lecture, we're going to try to analyze how these equations, how the solution of these equations look like uh, in these models. Questions. 
Questions about the exam? So what was the comment before that the, um, the Hubble law is interpreted in a wrong way? Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, because the Hubble law, the correct version is the one with the redshift, right? So I mean, the Hubble law is uh, based on Z. And uh, if we're sitting here and we're observing galaxies, then uh, Z has to do with the change of wavelengths going from here to there. And therefore we're observing an object not at T here, but way back, right? So the further we go in the past, the more to the past the event took place. And the calculation that I did at the beginning was had to do with velocities on the slice of constant t, right? And they have nothing to do with themselves, right? So in other words, this interpretation of the Hubble law as being velocity change of change of distance between points at a given time is actually completely wrong because we're not comparing things which happen at, at the same time. We're comparing things which happen along the light cone. That's one thing, right? And the second, uh, well, it is a velocity in the sense that uh, the distance changes. But if you think in terms of the geometry, I mean, the co-moving observers don't change. They're sitting there on their slice, right? It's the conformal factor that changes. So, uh, so this naive thinking that this is the velocity of, uh, that what we're seeing the velocity of recession is actually wrong, right? What we're seeing is a cosmological redshift, which has to do with the fact that the conformal factor of the universe was changing. So that was my comment. And maybe this is completely unorthodox and other people will tell you it's completely wrong because it's really the Hubble low has its distances and stuff like that. But that's the geometric interpretation for me is clear, has nothing to do with velocities of recession of objects at, at the current time. We're really measuring the rate of change of the scale factor of the universe. Other questions? Um, maybe, maybe those people um, think about this redshift as a Doppler redshift, because if the, if the cosmological distances are small enough, then some astrophysics experts say you can do that. You can think about this as a Doppler shift, and then this interpretation is makes more sense, right? Yes, right. Yeah, of course. I mean, and so 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 then the distance should be small, and the uh, uh, small in compared to the rate of changes of various things, right, in this universe, right? So yes, okay. I mean, one can think of it, and it's certainly true that uh, in my first calculation, that was the real physical distance uh, between these objects, right? Even though they had fixed space coordinates, the physical distance between those objects was changing. So uh, certainly for large Z, I don't think that the interpretation is correct. And of course, right now we have a, a measure of this uh, uh, relationship between Z and, uh, and distance for, for very large uh, Z's, right? And now the distance is the luminosity distance then that, that enters into these uh, considerations. Well, and which might be something different from the physical one, but that's a different story. Okay, other questions or comments? Well, if not, then I see you Thursday for the last lecture. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.